tonight. Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we are excited. We didn't have a lecture last month because um, with the rodeo traffic and all the other things going on, we were in competition with a lot of other people. So we thought we'd let everyone else go and do whatever they wanted and then all uh, come back to the museum. Um, as you know, uh, we have a couple of things. We are very excited because we are in the middle of our capital campaign. We have launched our capital campaign, moving on to build a museum. So someday, you'll have lots and lots of room. We'll have lectures where you could put, you know, four or 500 people in a room if you'd like to. So we, we hope to, to fill that in the museum. A um, couple of things. How many people here are new to the museum? Has anyone not been here before? Yay, fabulous. Well, welcome. Uh, one of the things we'd like to make sure that you have information about more about information about the museum. This is our brochure, and we have uh, memberships, family memberships, individual memberships, corporate, whatever you like. Uh, we'd love to have you join the museum. So, before we get started tonight, I wanted to remind you all, um, just before we forget, next month's lecture is the um, is Lawrence Schoenberger. We're very excited. Lawrence is going to present about the Battle of the Atlantic. And that is May 10th, so mark your calendars for that. And May 17th, we have an industry lecture, um, and it's going to be the ups and downs of jackups. And it's going to be really, again, very interesting. Uh, You'll have to come if you want to know all the details. Um, so, before, so that we can get started, we have a lot to talk about tonight, and um, Mark and I were just talking about treasure hunting. Um, so, Mark Lardis, I know many of you have been to some of his presentations before. He is a regular at the museum for a number of reasons. He's a, a, a I wouldn't say he's an amateur historian, I think he's a professional historian, um, and has, a, has degrees in naval architecture and marine engineering, but he ended up, instead of being in the water, in space. So he has worked most of his career in the, uh, as a space navigator uh, with NASA. He's also president of the Gulf Coast Ship Bomber Society, and they meet here on a regular basis, and we're very excited about Mark's newest book about Texas shipwrecks. So I'm gonna let him get started. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Today, basically, in, in part, this is a rollout for my new book, Texas Shipwrecks, but it's also to talk about, of course, this is going to happen. <laughs> I'll get back to where it's supposed to be there. And part of the problem is. Slideshow. Okay. Can you switch it to slide? Okay. Basically, um, what a lot of people don't realize is that Texas has a very long maritime heritage, and you can really tell the history of, you know, Texas's maritime heritage through the shipwrecks that have taken place. And this is actually covering a period from the early 1500s to the present. I'll be, I'll be talking about shipwrecks over about a 500 year period. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that Texas's recorded history started with a shipwreck. And in 1528, Cabeza de Vaca was shipwrecked on Galveston Island. He was part of a Spanish exploration expedition in Southeast America, Southeast United States. And they ran into more trouble with the local natives than they could handle, so they decided they needed to head to Veracruz in Mexico, and they built four or five barges and tried to sail to Mexico along, along the coast. And when they were off of what is 
now known as Galveston Island. They got caught by a storm. You can see the, the picture of the boat and forced onto Galveston Island and wrecked. There were about 200 people in the, on those boats. 80 of them survived the shipwreck. Um, within a year, all but four of them were dead. And then a few years uh, later, Debaca and his other three companions actually managed to hike across Texas to New Mexico, to what's now Santa Fe, and back to civilization. Debaca, when he returned to Spain, then proceeded to write a book about his adventures in Texas. So, you know, so as I said, why are shipwrecks important? In large part because if we had not had shipwrecks, we really wouldn't have had Texas history starting the way it did. So, what causes shipwrecks? A friend of mine, Dan Warren, told me that every shipwreck is caused by the same thing. Catastrophic loss of buoyancy. <laughs> but there are four really, really common reasons why you suddenly lose buoyancy and sink. The first one, of course, is storms. And let's face it, the Gulf of Mexico is known for stormy weather. And not just hurricanes, but northers. Um, and you'll also get equinoxial gales that will end up pushing ships onto the Texas coast. And once you're there, you know, you end up stranded. And that's actually another common way that you end up with a shipwreck. And there are lots of ways to get stranded in Texas waters. The coast is shallow. There are lots of shoals. The shoals shift. Um, the other thing is there were actually a lot of ships that ended up getting wrecked or stranded on Texas rivers because between 1830 and about 1900, the Texas rivers were the principal highways. So stranding is a really, really common way to end up getting a shipwreck. And in many ways, it's the most common way after storms, even today. A third common way, although this is relatively rare, would be losses through combat. And you can see that is a picture of the battle between the Hatteras and the Alabama. And the Alabama managed to lure the Hatteras away from a Union squadron and sink the thing after about a 20 minute battle. And that is now off the Flower Mound uh, Reef south of uh, south and east of Galveston. The final and actually I think this is probably the most common reason that you end up with a shipwreck is neglect. Anyone who owns a boat will tell you that it's a hole in the water in which you pour endless amounts of money. Okay? All ships leak. That's just a fact of nature. Um, you have to pump out the water faster than it comes in. And normally that's not a challenge, particularly if the water, if, if it's fairly calm. But it's expensive and you have to hire people and you have to, you know, spend money on maintenance. And in many cases, when a ship gets past its economic life, the owners will tie it up somewhere and just sort of walk away. And that steamboat there is a Texas River boat. It is the Alice Blair, and it was one of the one of the biggest uh, river boats on the Brazos River. And basically, that's what the owners did with it. They just tied it up, and walked away from it. Um, another river boat that I talk about in the book is the A.S. Ruffin. And it was just tied up at Magnolia, Texas, on the Trinity River. And this is up in Anderson County. Have any of you been to the Texas State Railroad? Yes. Yeah, OK. That's how far north that boat was. They just tied it up there. It was head of navigation. They tied it up there, took out the engines, and then just let it sink. And they eventually did find it. Uh, but that's a surprisingly common way 
for ships to sail. Now, what I find interesting is I tell people, I'm writing a book on shipwrecks. And what's the first thing you think I get asked? Are there any treasure ships? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, that's the first thing that people think of when you talk about shipwrecks. Spanish treasure, pirate treasure. And this is actually, honest to God, um, treasure from a ship that was wrecked on the Texas coast. Those are silver coins that were minted in Mexico. And those are essentially about five pound ingots of silver. The interesting thing is, Texas shipwreck, every historic Texas shipwreck has a value, but the value tends not to be in the silver and gold that's aboard the ship. And actually, it's very unusual to find a treasure ship. Number one, there aren't that many treasure ships. You know, the gold tends to stay in vaults and they tend to put it in big ships, they tend to put it in the most seaworthy ships. So, you know, everyone's read stories about that and everyone dreams about it, but it doesn't really happen. But there is a treasure aboard every historic shipwreck and that lies in the knowledge that you can get from it. And for example, that top picture on the, on the right shows a, cannonball that their shell that was fired and exploded and they're putting it back together and that was that was found at the Battle of Galveston. Below there you can see some of the exhibits of La Belle in, at the Bullock Museum. So every historic ship shipwreck has a value in the history and the story that it can tell. So let's talk about some Texas shipwrecks. And the first one, and probably the one that has been talked about the most and is the most famous are the 50 and 54 wrecks. And these were honest to God treasure ships that ended up getting shipwrecked and ended up creating a treasure hunt. And basically every year, the Spanish would take the gold and silver, mainly silver they had mined in Mexico loaded onto a number of ships in the port of Veracruz in Mexico, and then they would sail in a convoy to Havana. From there, it would be loaded onto another treasure flota that would then go to Spain. Okay, well, in 1554, things kind of went open loop. There were four ships in that treasure fleet, and they had almost gotten to Havana almost home when they got caught by a gale, an equinoxial gale. It wasn't a hurricane because it's the wrong season. And they ended up getting pushed back all the way to the Texas <coughs> coast and ended up three of the four ships, the Santa Maria de Clara, the Esprito Santu, and the Santa Bastion ended up getting wrecked on Padre <coughs> Island. Now, at this point, especially if you know anything about modern sailing ships, you know, how can that possibly happen? Well, the ships look kind of like that one. That, that's a model built by a friend of mine named Bill Wardell, and it is a model of a now, N-A-O, which was kind of the standard Spanish cargo ship. And as you can see, it's got high sides. It really doesn't have very much in the way of fore and aft sails, and that means that it's best on a soldier's wind, with the wind coming directly behind it, and it's very difficult for a ship like that to be into the wind. They're pretty well hostage to the wind, and that's the reason why they ended up getting stranded. About 200 people ended up ashore on Padre Island. Now, they're, they are about 300 miles from Veracruz. They thought they might be 30 miles from Veracruz. So they decided to hike there. And only 30 of them made it. The fourth ship did get back to Havana. It was a wreck. But it did get back and it said, hey guys, there's a whole bunch of treasure. 
stranded on, on Padre Island, the, the Spanish sent out a salvage expedition later that fall, and they got about 40% of the silver and the gold that was aboard those ships. Afterwards, the wrecks were forgotten because, well, the Spanish didn't want to advertise the fact that there was all this silver off the coast of Texas, which was territory they claimed but was pretty well uninhabited. So it was forgotten, the wrecks were forgotten. Then in the middle of the 20th century, the three ships ended up getting rediscovered. The first one they found was the Santa Maria de Clare. And that was discovered when they, when they dredged the Mansfield Cut. And basically, they dredged through the wreck. They didn't know it was there. And the first clue that they got, that there was something there that was a little bit more valuable than mud, was when a couple of coins appeared in the spoil that came out of the dredge. Uh -huh. By that time, they'd literally cut through the ship. Um, they did a little bit of, of exploring, and they managed to find one anchor, and that's the anchor on the left there. And that's now on display in, in the University of Texas A&M at Kingsville. But that was it. Now, that kind of tipped people off to the fact that there were you know, treasure ship wrecks off Padre Island. And 10 years later, in 1964, a local diver found the Espirito Santo, an honest-to-God treasure ship. So the, guy, the, the people who found it made a deal with a company called Platero to salvage the ship. Now, their definition of salvage was to essentially pump water in there and scatter everything away, all the sand, all the timbers, everything, until they found the gold and, and, and silver and could bring it up. The only problem with that is it turns out that that ship was, well, the property of the state of Texas, and a long lawsuit followed, and Texas prevailed. Eventually, Platero ended up having to turn over most of what they had found, and it, too, is on display in a museum, this one, Corpus Christi. The third ship, the San Esteban, was actually properly excavated. Um, Arnold Bartow, who is with the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, led that. Um, and they actually managed to recover 12 tons of artifacts, including the keel of the ship. And that's, that's what the picture on the bottom is. So that's kind of the story of the only real treasure ships that were shipwrecks off the Texas coast. Let's go forward a, 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 hundred, a couple of hundred years, or rather a, about 150 years, to the 1680s with the LaSalle expedition. And uh, this is the story of, of LaBelle and actually Texas, uh, LaSalle's Texas colony, which is the second flag over Texas. First flag, of course, is Mexican or Spanish. Second flag was France, and the reason why was LaSalle set up a colony here. Well, why did he do that? Well, he was commissioned by the King of, of France to set up a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River, except he was better at being a doughty explorer than a competent explorer, and they missed the mouth of the Mississippi. Picture that. How do you miss the mouth of the biggest river in North America? But they managed. And they ended up west of the Mississippi and kept sailing west until they came to Matagorda Bay. And remember, LaSalle has been, in Mississippi, been down the Mississippi. That's the reason that they got the idea. But LaSalle convinces himself, yeah, this has got to be the Mississippi. And, and I'm, you have to wonder why, but hey, OK. At any rate, they had three ships by that time. One of them was a French naval warship, and the captain of that had instructions to pretty well go home <coughs> once, he, uh, once he got the colony to land. And I guess 
he wasn't fond of LaSalle because he took off at the first opportunity. <laughs> they then had two ships left, Lamiable and LaBelle, and they were essentially supply ships. And first the Lamiable sunk, carrying most of the supplies, leaving the, the LaBelle as the only ship that was left. And then that one sank. And by, when that happened, the colony was truly cut off. They managed to aggravate the natives to the point where the natives attacked and wiped out most of the colony. LaSalle was killed by some of his own men when they were trying to hike overland to French possessions in the Great Lakes area. Four of them actually made it. Picture that. I mean, you know, that, that's pretty cool. But again, the ships disappeared. Then in 1995, they found one of them. They found LaBelle. And you can see, this is a picture of the ship on the bottom of Matagorda Bay. Um, they excavated on, on the site, and actually, it's still on the bottom, but they built a big coffer dam around that so they could lift the whole thing up. Um, the recovery, conservation, and restoration of the shipwreck artifacts took over 20 years, and it really is finishing up, the major part of it's finishing up, finishing up right now. LaBelle is, is on display, or what's left of LaBelle is on display at the Bullock Museum in Austin, Texas. It provided a wealth of experience about 17th century life at sea and in North America, and <coughs> as uh, Several of the marine archaeologists have told me what they essentially found was a colonization kit. So they, they learned how you would set up a colony in the 1600s in the New World. Okay, there are actually a lot of interesting shipwrecks between La Belle and the Civil War, but they're limiting the length of time I can talk. Besides, if I told you about all of them, you wouldn't buy my book, right? <laughs> so, let's talk about the Civil War and two aspects of it. The first one was naval battles, and they created a bunch of shipwrecks. And basically, if you know anything about Civil War history, you realize that the Union Navy was supreme virtually throughout the world. You know, a couple of setbacks, but mostly a string of victories, except whenever they went west of the Sabine River. Then they were snake bit. And there were three major battles fought um, off the Texas coast, and the North lost all three of them. It's about the only defeats that the Union Navy suffered during the American Civil War, a couple of others, but, but those are the big ones. The first one was the Battle of Galveston, which was fought December 31st, January, December 31st, 1862, January 1st, 1863. And a combined naval and Confederate Army force took Galveston Island, which had been occupied by the Union. A naval battle took place in the harbor, which ended up with a bunch of ships getting sunk on both sides and a very spectacular explosion was shown in that top picture when the Westfield was blown up to keep it from falling into the hands of the Confederates. Um, several decades later, actually a few years ago, in this century, they excavated what was left of the Westfield. Now, one of the questions I asked Justin Parkhoff, who was Part of the group that was doing that is, why did it take so long? And the basic answer was, well, after the Civil War, it wasn't a historic shipwreck. It was a, it was a hazard to navigation. So apparently, they blew up the wreck in, in order to uh, make it more make navigation into Texas City and into Galveston easier. But by the 21st century. It was a historic shipwreck, so they did do an excavation, and actually a pretty quick one. And artifacts of that are at the Texas City Museum. You can see one of their cannons, and they're actually putting together a display of the engine. Another battle took place 10 days after that, 
off the Texas coast. And I, I talked about that briefly earlier. And that was the battle between the CSS Alabama and the USS Hatteras. When the Union learned, the Union Navy learned that Galveston had fallen, Admiral Farragut sent a force of seven ships from New Orleans to Galveston to find out what was going on. They had just arrived there when the Raider Alabama came sailing up. Sims had also heard that um, Galveston had fallen and he'd heard a rumor that the Union was going to send an invasion force there. And he decided a good trade for the Alabama would be to wipe out the, the troop ships. Except when he got there, he didn't find an invasion force. He found a bunch of Union warships. And that wasn't what he wanted to do. So he pulled away. And the Union commander sent one of his ships, a fairly weak one called the Hatteras, to investigate this strange sail. And basically, Sims lured him far enough away from the rest of the fleet that they couldn't see what was going on, revealed who he was, they ended up in a battle, uh, and the Hatteras was sunk, and it has stayed there ever since. And this is a side scan sonar image of what's left of the Hatteras. And you can see the paddle wheels and the drive shaft, and you can see part of the bow. So basically it's the metal stuff that ends up being left. Finally, there was the Battle of Sabine Pass, which was fought in September 8, 1863. And this time, the Union was trying to invade Texas. They had a big uh, invasion force that they were going to land at Sabine Pass. The problem was there was a fort there, Mud Fort, the Six Guns, 51 Confederates and the Davis Guards, and they were all can you have Irish good old boys? I guess you really can. But that's what they were, I mean, functionally. And they've been stuck out on this fort by themselves because they were kind of boisterous. And, but they were told that, hey guys, you can practice, you can fire the guns as much as you want to. 51 guys in their 20s and 30s and you're telling them, oh, you can practice with these big guns? These guys learned how to use those guns. They sighted everything. <laughs> Oddly enough, 51 men against several thousand and four warships. It wasn't an even fight. It ended up favoring the Confederates. Two Union ships were sunk, the Clifton and the Arizona. The Clifton was later, and actually both of them were later salvaged by the Confederates and used as transports. And then the Clifton was blown up at the end of the war. Um, afterwards, the engines were salvaged and examined, and also the walking beam, which is on the bottom, was put up on the battlefield as a memorial to the, to the battle. The Union kind of got their revenge against the blockade runners. Now, the Union had declared a blockade against the Confederacy, which meant that anyone running cargoes into and out of southern ports was liable to get napped by the Union blockaders. And it was a pretty porous blockade, but still, over the life of it, they managed to sink, or, uh, sink uh, 30, 33 ships, 27 sailing ships, or six um, and six steamships. Um, Several of the steamships in particular were discovered in the late 20th century and early 21st century. The one on top, this is what was left of the blockade runner Denby, which is near the approaches to Galveston, and the wreck surface during extremely low water in Galveston Harbor, and then ended up being examined by marine archaeologists and engineers at Texas A&M at Galveston. Um, and they're still <coughs> examining it. Three other blockade runners that were found, and they were all found near, near Galveston, were the Acadia, Willow, <coughs> and the Caroline. The Acadia 
St. Near, Brazoria, off the coast, uh, Will of the Wisp and Caroline sunk off of Galveston Island. And this is a magnumometer reading. At the time they made this, they thought it was the Will of the Wisp. Now they think it may be the Caroline. They still haven't decided, but they will eventually. Another source of shipwrecks or steamships, because the Gulf of Mexico was how you got to Texas um, in the 19th century. There was a lot of commercial traffic. There isn't any sense in growing cotton in Texas if you can't ship it somewhere, and the only way they could ship it was by sea. Um, chief ports included Galveston. Galveston was actually the big one. You can see Galveston in the 1880s, and you can see how crowded the harbor is, and that was actually pretty typical. Other ports included Indianola, Velasco, and Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi was tended to be a fairly minor port back then because the water into it was extremely shallow. Indianola ends up getting built by Morgan, up who started the Morgan line as a competitor to Velasco because they charged him too much. The two primary steamship lines that served the Gulf were the Mallory line, which sailed between New York and Gulf ports, and the Morgan line. Now, the thing is that these steamships were first generation vessels, very primitive. There were plenty of ways for them to sink. A lot of them caught fire or ended up breaking up because they weren't built strong enough or ended up getting caught in storms. This is a sonar image of what of the city of Waco, which was a Morgan Line steamship that ended up getting caught outside the bar at Galveston when a storm came up. And somehow during that storm, some of its cargo, which was highly flammable liquid fuel, ended up leaking, caught fire, and the ship burned and sank off of Galveston, just south of Galveston Island. And a lot of people ended up being killed on that. But that's actually, unfortunately, pretty typical. I'm going to tell the story of one of these ships, basically because it feeds into the whole myth of the, uh, the shipwreck as a treasure trove. The, uh, the New York was a Morgan Line steamship. It was one of the earliest ones. You can see it here. Uh, one of the had first generation steam engines. It was originally built to service the Atlantic coast when it became obsolete for that. Uh, Morgan bought it and ran it between New Orleans and Galveston. Well, in 1846, it ended up getting caught in a hurricane and it was and sunk. Coincidentally, the ship had the payroll for the army in Texas aboard. And of course, this is the start of the Spanish, the Mexican-American War, and so the payroll was pretty substantial. So there were all these rumors about the ship containing between thirty and forty thousand dollars in gold coins, silver coins, and currency. It was found by an oil offshore oil field worker. And he found it by examining records of where nets got snagged, shrimp nets, and decided that that had to be where the shipwreck was. And they ended up salvaging it as a commercial venture. It was not in Texas waters, so commercial salvage rights applied. However, they did work with marine archaeologists to do a proper dig of the ship. Sad to say, it turns out that most of the payroll must have been in the form of currency. <laughs> because they didn't find a locker full of, of gold and silver coins. Um, they found a few coins. They actually did find a lot of really interesting artifacts aboard the ship. And those were auctioned, and the, the company that ended up salvaging it actually did make a profit on it. But um, there was a lot of knowledge harvested, included how the first generation of, of marine steam engines worked. And if you're you know, a marine history wonk like I am, you know, that's more interesting than the, than the coins. Another source of shipwrecks in Texas are the Texas rivers. 
And people don't think of Texas rivers as, you know, why do we have steamboats on Texas rivers? And again, that was because in the 19th century, particularly between the 1830s to at least the 1880s, and really through 1900, that was the most economical way to move cargo, was on steamboats along Texas rivers. Uh, the navigable rivers included the Natchez, Trinity, Buffalo Bayou, Brazos River, and Rio Grande. Today, the only two that are still considered navigable are the Brazos, I mean, sorry, the Buffalo Bayou, of course, because of the ship channel and the Natchez River. Um, there was also um, Marshall, Texas, was Texas's second largest seaport or port, river port, really, because you could get to the Mississippi River from the Cat from Caddo Lake. Um, plus, there were a lot of steamboats on the Red River, although technically, that is Oklahoma shipwrecks because the Texas border ends at the river's edge. But that's okay. We'll claim them as Texas shipwrecks anyway. <laughs> Anyhow, some notable river wrecks, the Cleona and the Black Cloud were two of the Brazos, I'm sorry, the Trinity River wrecks. Black Cloud was actually really interesting because it was one of the first uh, wrecks discovered in the mid 20th century, uh, roughly the uh, 1970s, and that was about the time that Texas A&M had its marine archaeology program starting up. And that was one of the first uh, boats that was actually excavated properly. They found a lot of interesting stuff. Another interesting story is when the ship went down, the ship's owners donated its bell to the Methodist church there. And it's still there. My son and I actually went up to the belfry and took a picture of the bell. And actually, I guess, you know, you can say that every time a Texas steamboat sinks, a museum gets a bell. <laughs> because, you know, some of the other ones, um, the Brazos River wrecks include the Hiawatha and the Alice Blair, and they've got the, the bells from both of those in the Columbia Museum. Um, another famous shipwreck, and this was really famous in the worst sense of the word, was the Mitty Stevens which was a you know, first class Mississippi River boat. And they even wrote a song about it called Mitty Stevens March. At any rate, it was sailing into Texas through Caddo Lake at night and they, they had these torches that they used to illuminate the front of the ship. Well, some sparks came off of that, landed in some hay that they were carrying as cargo and the ship caught fire the captain tried to run it aground, but managed to strand it in the middle of the river in water that was over the heads of most of the people. And most of the passengers and crew either burned or drowned. Um, the bell was salvaged again, and it is now in the, the museum in Marshall. The Red River wreck that I was talking about is this one. That's the hero. And it had been hired to carry supplies into the Indian Territory. Because by treaty, the, the United States government was providing the Indians with food. Well, while it was steaming up the Red River, it hit a snag, which is essentially a sunken log, that ripped the bottom out of the ship, and it sank. The river has sort of wandered back and forth, but it was still in the river and it was found about five or six years ago when Texas A&M was hired to excavate it. This is a model of the ship, of the heroine as it looks today, being explored by a couple of divers. This was, this was made by Glenn Greco, who is the model maker at Texas A&M, and, and boy, you know, I wish I could do half as well. I wish I could do a quarter as well as he did. So, another source of shipwrecks, of course, is hurricanes. And this is the point 
Somebody asked me if I was going to have a pop quiz, but I'm going to do some audience participation <laughs> because this is the part where everyone starts falling asleep, so I want to wake everyone up. <laughs> now, everyone's heard of the 1900 hurricane, right? That's history. Very, a lot fewer people have heard of the 1915 hurricane, but the 1915 hurricane was almost as destructive as the 1900 hurricane, except for the fact that the seawall kept the island from getting flooded. Now these four pictures, two of them are from the 1915 hurricane, two of them are from the 1900 hurricane. So, anyone want to tell me 1915 or 1900? 1915. Hmm? 1915. 1915. That is 1915. Those are the steamships Eaton Hall and Harrelston stranded on Virginia Point north of Galveston after the 1915 hurricane. Ironically, they were British steamships, and those guys probably thought they were safe from the war, but they weren't safe from the hurricane. How about this one? 1900 or 1915? 1900. This one is 1900. This is a dredge. That's the thing that they use to deepen the channels so you can actually turn Galveston and Houston into seaports. That one was found about five miles inland. Wow. Carried, <laughs> carried in there by the waters and then the waters receded. Oh well. I'm sure they, dis they dismantled it in place. I don't see how they could have gotten it out of there. Okay, how about that one? 1900 or 1915? 1900. It is 1900, and that is Pier 22. What's Pier wow. 20? That that's what Pier 22 looked like at the end of the 1900 hurricane. Does anybody know what's at Pier 22 today? That, no, that's Pier 21. Actually, Pier 22 is pretty close to where the uh, cruise boat now sail from. Okay, how about that? 1915 or 1900? This, that one is 1915. This is Pier 19 where the offshore platform museum is. And no, that, that wasn't an offshore rig, that was just a tower that got tipped over. So, you know, as, as I said, there, there are some interesting stories about Galveston hurricanes. Let's go up to World War I. And of course, I'm sure a lot of people think, hey, there had to have been a lot of ships sunk during World War I. Well, there were, but not in the Gulf of Mexico and certainly not in the Texas Gulf Coast. There was only one warship that sank on the Texas Gulf Coast during World War I. The USS Elizabeth, which was a patrol boat that managed to run ashore near Velasco and was totaled. However, World War I actually produced a bumper crop of Texas shipwrecks due to the Emergency Fleet Corporation. It's a fascinating story of Ferris boats and concrete ships. And the Ferris boats weren't made out of iron, as you'd think by the name. They were designed by a gentleman named Ferris. And basically, um, when the United States entered the war, the Germans were sinking record numbers of merchant ships. So the goal was to build as many cargo ships as possible, as fast as possible. And gee whiz, we can't build any more iron and steel ships because all the shipyards are full. So they designed this Ferris boat, which is essentially a wooden boat with a reciprocating engine. You know, low technology back even for them, but they could be built quickly and cheaply. <coughs> and they didn't use uh, strategic materials. The only problem was when the war ended, there were almost 400 of these ships ordered. There were 75 contracts let in Texas, 34 in Louisiana, and most of them pretty well got started. Only a few of them were finished by the time the war ended. But then the, the ships are absolutely worthless. Why do you want a bunch of wooden-hauled ships with these weak 
reciprocating engine, when you got a whole bunch of new construction because they're building the Hog Islanders, their World War I's equivalent of the Liberty ship, and they had a whole bunch of brand new big steel hauled cargo ships with modern engines. So what do you do with these things? A few of them, like the Unita, were converted into barges and used you know, for storage. Most of them, however, were towed up the Natchez River, anchored, the, the metal bits and engines taken out of them, and then the hulls were just left there, and eventually they sank. And you can still see the wrecks there today. Uh, the Texas Archaeology Department is planning a big dig there, because even an odd wooden hull obsolescent ship becomes historical given a long enough time. Mm -hmm. The Unita, the one that I mentioned earlier, ended up being used as a barge for about a year, and then it broke its toe when it was entering Corpus Christi and sank. And they um, excavated that as part of a general survey of the harbor of Corpus Christi, and that's what's left of it. It's, it's just a few metal tanks. Um, the Emergency Fleet Corporation also built 17 concrete ships. That included a ship called the SS Selma that was actually finished and used as a tanker by a commercial company. Now, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, you can't make ships out of concrete. Concrete sinks. Well, you know, iron sinks too, so does steel. The interesting thing is the concrete has the same density as aluminum, so it's a whole lot lighter than iron or steel. The problem with concrete is, if you knock a hole in it, it's really hard to patch. <laughs> and that's kind of what happened to the Selma. It ended up hitting a dock hard um, in, I think, Jacksonville, Florida, and they knocked a hole in it, in the side. And now you've got a tanker that's leaking. So the owners steamed it over to Galveston, I think the Todd Shipyards, and said, fix it. And Todd Shipyards said, you're kidding. <laughs> well, at which point the owners are paying a fortune for the fuel and the pumps to pump the stinking ship dry. So what they did was they pulled the, they pulled the pumps, pulled everything out of there, essentially told the Coast Guard, it's yours, and walked away. <laughs> and now we've got this big concrete ship in the ship channel sinking. So the Coast Guard towed it to Pelican Island and, and ran it aground there, and it's still there. <laughs> and it is Galveston's concrete ship. If you look carefully, these are people. There's a fishing boat right there. It's, it's, one of its uses is as a fishing pier to this day, so let's hear it for the Emergency Fleet Corporation, which proves again that when the government gets an idea, they usually get it all wrong. <laughs> let's talk about World War II. And there were a lot of shipwrecks in World War II and a lot in the Gulf, but not all that many off the Texas coast. There were a lot of ships that sailed from Texas that ended up getting sunk because Texas was a source of petroleum and that crude oil had to go to plants in New Jersey in order to turn it into diesel, gasoline, whatever. Um, the problem was that there were a lot of German U-boats in the Gulf and they tended to gather in Louisiana south of uh, New Orleans. And that was the happy hunting ground, so there were a lot of Texas tankers that were out, outbound from te Texas that ended up getting sunk there, including this one. That's the Gulf Pen, which was explored in the first decade of this century by someone who actually comes to this museum a lot. Dan Warren was part of the team that did explore it. Um, there were actually only three ships that were torpedoed in Texas waters, two offshore near, um, near Brownsville, and one near Port O'Connor, 
on the Texas coast, and that was this one, the SS Oxala, which was a Mexican flagship. And that was actually one of the reasons why Mexico entered the war and declared war on Germany. So, no, the Germans didn't land landing parties on Galveston Island in order to get shore leave. <laughs> but it's a good story. Okay, another famous set of Texas shipwrecks involves the Texas City disaster, which happened on April 17, 1947, and the people of Texas City must have thought that World War II had started again. What happened was there was a French ship, the Grand Camp, it was a Liberty ship, and it was loading ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and the fertilizer caught fire. And they didn't suppress the fire properly. Part of what they did was sealed the hole and pumped steam in there. The problem is that ammonium nitrate, hot ammonium nitrate actually reacts with steam to burn hotter and longer. So they were kind of feeding the fire instead of starving it. Then what happened is after a while, the fire ended up melting the fuel oil bunkers in the ship. And when you mix fuel oil with ammonium nitrate, you get the Murrah Center. And basically that's what happened is you got a big, uh, you know, fuel fertilizer bomb and it exploded. And it sent debris everywhere. In fact, the Grand Camp's anchor was found 1.6 miles from the harbor. That's the, the anchor right there. And you can see one of the flukes blew, uh, was broken off. A lot of the debris landed on a ship called the High Flyer, which was a likes flying ship. It was also loading ammonium nitrate. And it caught fire too. And by in the evening, it exploded. And that sent debris everywhere, and that sank a third ship, which was Wilson B. Keene. That one didn't blow up, that just sank. But when everything was over, 581 people were dead, including every member of the uh, Texas City Fire Department. Um, the event really has left a mark on Texas City. The anchor that's pictured there is in the memorial park that they have for Texas City. Okay, let's bring it up to the present. And there are kind of two spectacular sources of shipwrecks after World War II. The first one is hurricanes. And hurricanes do not like shrimp boats. Hurricanes get double points or maybe triple points for wrecking a uh, shrimp boat. So here are three examples. This is the Holiday Club at Rances Pass in 1970, and virtually every shrimp boat in the harbor ends up coming for a visit. <laughs> Hurricane Rita in 2005. That's another shrimp boat. That one's on a fuel dock, and that one's total too. Now, how many people here have been to Willie G's in Galveston? Okay. Obviously, that shrimp boat in the bottom decided it wanted to stop there too. Because you can see Willie G's here. This is behind the parking lot. So I mean, you know, that thing got completely around. So fortunately, I don't think there were any lives lost in any of these. And they do make for some spectacular pictures. Another source of shipwrecks ends up being Texas's petrochemical industry. Especially during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, tankers had a distressing habit of exploding. Two of the most famous ones include the VA fog, in 1971 and the oil charger in 1983. And basically the problem is with a tanker, once you pump out the fuel that it's carrying, you're left with a lot of volatile gases in there. And you're left with a mixture of oxygen and volatile gases. 
and if you end up getting a spark, it goes boom. And that's what happened with the BA fog. With the BA fog, what they were trying to do was air out the thing. They, they dropped big industrial fans down there, electric fans, and started them up, and there was a spark, and you can see what happened to the ship. Uh, OMI charger, very similar story. In this case, there were welding, and the welding sparks touched off fumes that were in the tank that had been emptied. Since then, they have, uh, the Coast Guard has insisted that ships fill the tanks with inert gas. So a lot of that's still gone away, but you still see it occasionally, uh, a lot, especially with barges. Exploring Texas shipwrecks. At this point, I'd really like to mention the Institute of Nautical Archaeology. It is a world-class research institution, and it conducts expeditions all over the world. And it's been involved in studies with many of these wrecks that I've talked about, including the 1554 ships, LaBelle, Westfield and Hatteras, Black Cloud, Heroin, and Caney Creek wreck. Caney Creek wreck is an interesting one. Caney Creek is about 50 miles from Galveston, a steamboat sank there, I mean, 50 miles from Pollock Station, a steamboat sank there, and that's kind of where they send the students for their first dig. There have been a lot of digs there, because you can go out there, you can do some study, you can come back and meet your, get to your classes the next day. Uh, they've got a lot of stuff there, including classrooms. This is a big tank that they can fill with something called uh, PEG petrol ethyl glycol, which is used to preserve timbers that have been submerged for a long time. And this is an inside shot of the freeze dry chamber they have. That's wood from the uh, label being dried as the final step in the process. Okay, everyone's ready to start exploring historic Texas shipwrecks, right? It's a bad idea. <clears throat> it's a bad idea for four reasons. First off, if you're diving on a U.S. Navy warship or even a Confederate Navy warship, it's property of the United States. That's international law. And in fact, when LaBelle was found, the French insisted that it was a French warship and it belonged to France. And there was kind of a fight over it where they, the Texans are ready to start flying that flag with the cannon. <laughs> you know, but the deal was made is that we would say, yeah, it belonged to France, and France said, yeah, you can keep it in Texas. <laughs> but when people, some, some commercial divers, dive on the Hatteras in the 1960s and retrieved cannonballs and other artifacts and tried to sell them in the U.S. Navy suit and got them back. The other interesting thing is the state of Texas owns every historic shipwreck in Texas waters. And that's defined as anything under the ground or within 12 miles of the Texas coast, and that includes anything in Texas rivers. And they actually went to the Supreme Court to, to secure that right in the 1960s, actually before the 1554 wrecks. So if you take something, you know, it belongs to the state and you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and in fact, Apparently, anything that's been in the ground for more than 50 years, if it has historic significance, it belongs to the state. So forget about finding buried loot from a bank robbery <laughs> a century ago. The other thing is, exploring Texas shipwrecks can be dangerous because Texas waters are really muddy. This is a diver. The picture was taken during one of the explorations of the Denby. The photographer is this far away from the diver who's being photographed. In that type of a situation, you can get yourself in a world of hurt really, really quickly. Finally, if you just take stuff every which way, you destroy its historic context. What's that piece of wood? It doesn't look like much. Okay, it's a piece of wood with a couple of chunks of iron in it. But what it is, is it's the drive shaft for the steamboat Black Cloud. And if somebody had just grabbed it and stuck it on their mantle, nobody would know what it was. So now that I've discouraged you from doing that, <laughs> if you are a diver and you want to explore shipwrecks off the Texas coast, you can actually do it. 
Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife sponsors a Ships to Reef program. That is the Texas Clipper sinking, and that's what it's supposed to look like. And divers are allowed to, and in fact encouraged, to visit the ships that were turned into reefs, and any fish you catch are yours, and as long as you stay within bag limits. If you're interested, that's the website, or just do a web search on Texas TP, TPWD ships to reefs. It'll, it'll pop up. Okay. I've probably gone on long enough. At this point, people are saying, well, this is all interesting. But are there still interesting shipwreck stories today, besides fish, besides shrimp boats deciding to visit Willie G's? This is actually, I think, a really cool Texas shipwreck story that happened less than a year and a half ago. The sail, this sailboat sank in a squall in October 2014. Family of six were aboard. One of the children ended up, they all ended up being rescued. One of the children ended up uh, stopped breathing and had to be given artificial respiration. But when everything was said and done, the family were all injured. However, when they checked out of the hospital, they then disappeared, gone. And they discovered the names that they'd given were an alias. Well, it turned out what they were doing is they bought that sailboat and they were going to sail to Central America in it with money that they had gotten from a fodder scam. They had managed to sell the same fodder seven or eight times <laughs> and ended up with a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars in ill-gotten gains and you know in the best traditions of Jean Lafitte they were going to skip the country by boat and set themselves up in a you know tropical paradise except they were so loverly they blew it so I guess you know I think there's still romance and shipwrecks in Texas <laughs> even if it occasionally involves high comedy uh, it was a fodder scam. Scam fodder, hay, cattle feed. They were they were selling the same cattle feed. They were buying they were buying cattle feed from a farmer, and then selling it to another farmer, and selling it several times and not paying the first farmer. And it's like I said, they ended up with a million dollars, and they decided it was time to get out of the United States. So, any questions? Uh, to, to emulate Marco Polo, there are many millions more stories. <laughs> if you're interested, the book's for sale at the back. Great. And Mark will be here, so you have, if you have questions, you can talk to him about that. And I wanted to... Uh, thank you very much, and this is for you. Thank and thanks so much for being here because we uh, love your stories. They're awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Not related directly to shipwrecks, but the nautical archaeology. College stations seem to kind of like an unlikely place for nautical archaeology. Who came up with the idea of well, let's do that in college stations? That's actually a really, really good question, and that actually would deserve a book by itself. <laughs> Basically, there was no systematic study of marine archaeology prior to the 1970s. There was a guy named Steffi who was pretty much a self-taught archaeologist. Um, I think it was George Bass ended up starting a program in Texas. There wasn't one anywhere else. And as a result, I mean, it's kind of like the port of Houston ends up getting to be so big because it's the first port that has containers. Texas A&M was the first college that did a systematic study of marine archaeology. So it just sort of happened. Well, we have this, you know, the Maritime School in Galveston, so they had a connection. Yeah, um, that was actually set up as a maritime academy to train <coughs> officers 
for the United States Merchant Marine. But yeah, they actually do marine archaeology too. I think this INA in College Station really started out as a part of the Department of Anthropology. Yes. And then it grew into what it is now. So it kind of grew out of that element of the study of anthropology. Your books are so thorough that everybody, all the questions are, you know, are answered. Uh, we have one more here, sir. Isn't there another concrete ship sunk on the east jetties? Yes. Uh, yes. There, there were there were 19 concrete ships built, um, and there were two of them that were wrecked. Galveston is one. I, I I'm not sure where the other one is. Well, but, yeah. There is one laying right across the east jetties past the boat pass there. Okay. As a child, they used to mess around with it, but I don't know the name of it or what happened. Yes, sir. Are there anything you never managed to sink the CSS Alabama? Yes, the Alabama ended up um, getting caught by the USS Kearsarge <coughs> off Cherbourg. It had fought a famous duel in which it, it did finally end up sinking. Um, the French artist Manet ended up doing a painting of the battle of the sinking of the Alabama. So another fascinating story. That's right. We had a lecture about that. Harrington Weems included it in one yep. of his uh, uh, famous maritime famous maritime stories. I have one uh, kind of an unusual. I'd like to thank somebody here tonight who Larry Lipton has been doing our video for such a long time. He's an incredible um, volunteer here, and he's been doing this since we started these series. And I want to thank him very much. I hope Important part of memorializing our, our lectures that you know, if it weren't for you doing this, we wouldn't be able to do it. I would like to give you this. Thank you very much. This is how, this is how we're, um, one of the things we're so fortunate because we have amazing volunteers. We have Larry that comes, you know, Mark comes and works with the modelers, you know, Lawrence and Eric and Bert and everybody else here. We're just very, very fortunate. So we just want to thank you very much. I'll have a good evening. Is the video available?